Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'm going to recap and review the first episode in HBO's new series, Lovecraft Country. It's based on a book with the same name by Matt Ruff, which I've read. The premiere episode is titled Sundown. It was written by showrunner Misha Green and does a pretty good job of introducing us to the characters while building up the world where the series takes place. Before we get into all of that, this is your spoiler warning. I'm going to talk about everything that happens in episode 1 of Lovecraft Country. I'm also going to make some references to the source material, but this video won't include any future spoilers about how things play out in the book. Things open up with Atticus Freeman, who goes by Tick, on his way back to his hometown of Chicago. We'll learn that he received a letter from his father about his mother and a secret legacy that set things into motion. But not before we get this amazing opening dream sequence that gives us some insight into who he is and a sense of what we can expect from the series. Tick is a veteran of the Korean War, and that's where we find him in the black and white opening of the dream. As he's fighting his way through trenches, we see some planes overhead drop a bomb in the distance. As things shift from black and white to color, we hear movie narration from the Jackie Robinson story saying, this is a story of a boy in his dream. But more than that, it's the story of an American boy in a dream that is truly American. From there, the dream morphs from a war movie to sci-fi with flying saucers and what looks like tripods from H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. A new character drifts down from one of the flying saucers, a red-skinned alien who I presume is connected to the book that we see Tick reading, A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. She embraces Tick, but that gets interrupted by a winged creature with an octopus-like head. This is one of H.P. Lovecraft's best-known fictional cosmic monsters, known as Kalulhu. Kalulhu is momentarily dispatched by Jackie Robinson himself using his baseball bat. The narration from his biopic had continued in the background throughout the scene, but as the monster reconstitutes itself, to take a second run at them, Atticus wakes up. We see him flip off the Jim Crow South as they enter Kentucky, only to quickly be reminded that crossing state lines doesn't solve all the problems black Americans are confronted with. Their bus breaks down, and Tick and the other black passenger are left to walk back to town as the white passengers are shuttled into the back of a pickup truck. On their walk, the woman asks him about his book, and is surprised that he chose one with the main character being a Confederate captain who fought for slavery. He responds telling her that stories are like people. Loving them doesn't make them perfect. You just try to cherish them, overlook their flaws. This serves as a great setup for his return home to Chicago and his reunion with his family. We meet his uncle George, who publishes the Safe Negro Travel Guide, which is a guidebook that helps black Americans find businesses that will serve them as they navigate the country. George is a fellow fan of horror and sci-fi literature, and we meet his wife Hippolyta and their daughter Diana. While we'll discover that Tick's relationship with his father is complicated and somewhat messy, we get the idea that the neighborhood he grew up in and things with his extended family are generally pretty good, particularly in comparison to the areas of the country they'll travel through when they go looking for his father, who we learn has been missing for two weeks. Tick had returned to Chicago after receiving a letter from his dad, Montrose, which he reads to his uncle. He mentions the past and his mother trying to forget about it. George had previously mentioned that Tick's mother's ancestry was a mystery, and according to the letter, Atticus had a secret legacy, a birthright that's been kept from him. This leads to a road trip to find Montrose with Uncle George and a childhood friend, Letitia Lewis, who goes by Letty. We get a brief introduction to Letty as she reunites with her sister Ruby, who is performing on stage during a block party. There's tension between them that we'll inevitably learn about, but for now it serves to have Letty hitching a ride to her brother's house, which happens to be on the way to Ardham, Massachusetts. This is the town where Tick and George think Montrose will be found based on the letter. Atticus initially misread the name as Arkham, which is a fictional town from H.P. Lovecraft's writing, which is how the series gets its name, while Artem has nothing to do with the idea of Lovecraft country that he was thinking about that doesn't mean that there won't be cosmic horrors in store when they find it. During the journey, we get a direct look into the real-life horror that our trio of travelers are up against. We see billboards warning of sundown towns, barking dogs apparently trained to be aggressive towards people of color, white teenagers acting like monkeys to mock them, and a segregated ice cream stand, all of which exist in the north rather than the explicitly segregated south. 
things get turned up a notch when the travelers decide to stop for lunch at a place that was in the guidebook. The fact that the name has been changed doesn't deter them, but inside it becomes clear that the previous owner had been burned out in an act of arson. The kid behind the counter dips into the back room where he places a call, which leads to a high-speed chase with the presumed arsonist. With the help of a mysterious blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white-as-you-possibly-could-be woman driving a silver Bentley, our travelers are able to make it out alive. It's not immediately clear how she's able to cause them to crash, but there does seem to be something supernatural going on. She arrives precisely at the right time, and their truck flipped over without actually hitting her car. Of course, Tick, Letty, and George aren't going to stick around to find out who she is. They flee the scene and make their way to the home of Letty's brother. While there we learn more about all three characters. We see that George cares for his family as he talks to his wife and daughter on the phone. We learn that Tick's father was abused as a child, but also grew up to be an abuser himself. And we learn that Letty's past has strained her relationship with her brother in the same way it had with her sister. While all of this is in the background of what's to come in the rest of the episode, I thought they did a nice job of weaving it all together. Seeing George stop Tick from going inside to try to help Letty while she was fighting with her brother because it was family business, and then that leading to them discussing their own family's dirty secrets stood out to me. Back on the road the next day, the gang can't find their final turn to Artem. They pull over to try to get their bearings, and a racist sheriff that Letty's brother already warned them about arrives on the scene. He explains that they're in a sundown county, and if he'd found them after dark, it would have been his sworn duty to hang them from the trees. What's more is they only have seven minutes until sundown. After an excruciating back and forth about which way they could go to make it out of the county in time, and whether or not they can legally make a U-turn, a low speed chase to the county line ensues. This is without a doubt the most intense and terrifying sequence of the episode. It's a distance that they can't be sure they can cover in the amount of time they have left, and the sheriff rides their bumper while promising to pull them over if they go over the speed limit. There's a brief moment of relief as they make it in time, but we learn that they never had a chance in the first place as the road is blocked by deputies on the other side. It turns out the whole thing was a ruse, since they were planning on arresting them for an unrelated string of burglaries in the area. At the end of the day, Sheriff Hunt is just looking for a reason to murder some black folk, and he's about to get his wish as the cops walk them into the woods and force them to the ground. As they're getting ready to execute them, things take a turn. A pack of Shagas arrive on the scene and start attacking the officer. These are fictional undead creatures from Lovecraft's writing, which Tick and George might recognize. Either way, the thing that happens here is that George's love of fiction and horror stories gives him an idea. These things could be like vampires. They didn't see them until after dark, so perhaps they can use light to keep them away. This will turn out to be enough to save the trio, but not before things devolve into full-blown gore. While Letty makes a run for the car, the sheriff turns into a Shawgoth after being bit, and rather than shooting him, his deputy decides to keep the gun aimed at Tick and George. It's a pretty fitting ending when he's torn to pieces just before Letty returns to run over the transformed sheriff. The episode comes to an end as they make it to their final destination after sunrise. Covered in blood, they walk up to a giant home nestled beyond the woods in Artem. There's a silver Bentley parked out front that we've seen more than once in the episode, but a different blonde, this time a man, opens the door just as they're about to knock. Strangely, he greets them by telling Atticus that they've been expecting him and finishes with welcome home. It fades to black as we look at the trio of travelers who are definitely definitely surprised by this turn of events. So all in all, I think this was a pretty good episode as far as setting up the story. It actually covered a lot of ground in the book and it stayed pretty true as far as being an adaptation with just a few minor changes. I suppose we can't really talk about the series without talking about Lovecraft himself. Fans of his work may not realize that this is based on a book that doesn't really have a lot to do with him. If you're unfamiliar, for what it's worth, H.P. Lovecraft is an early 20th century American writer whose work became famous after he was already dead. He basically wrote horror or what was known as weird fiction during his lifetime, and most of his work was published in pulp magazines. He died pretty young at age 46, and then went on to become regarded as a significant author of supernatural horror fiction. 
You'll hear people refer to contemporary works as Lovecraftian or put things into the subcategory of cosmic horror, which would be similar to what he wrote. The other thing to know about him was that he was a crazy racist. Even in a time when people were generally more racist, he stands out as being super freaking racist. And so when I read the book Lovecraft Country, what I thought about it and what I'm sure will come out in this series, one of the first things that comes to mind is there's a parallel between the paranoid sort of horror that H.P. Lovecraft lived with and his fear of the other, which included people of color immigrants, generally people outside of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant ideal in his mind. That's paralleled by the Freemans and their fear of the other who actually do want to harm them. So that does work pretty well, I think. It's not a bait and switch in like, oh, well, there's all these monsters, but the real monsters are the white people. It's not like that. It's more of a, this guy who wrote about all these monsters, he spent his life consumed by fear of the other. In this story, we have characters who are fans of his stories despite the fact that his racist beliefs would lead him to see them as less than human. So in a way, what he feared was happening to him in his life as a result of the existence of the racial other happens all the time and tick in the other characters' lives. Like I said, I think that mostly works. I think the biggest potential for disappointment would be for people who love cosmic horror and are expecting this to be in that vein where I think this first episode shows us that while the execution was good, while the creatures look good and the CGI is fine, it's more of a story about the the family connections rather than a straight up horror story. I mean, for me, it's like there's no buildup for it. There was no lingering hints that there's this scary thing out in the background waiting to discover what it is. It just showed up. With that said, though, I did like this story. My biggest gripe with the book is that it is a collection of stories that are all related, but I didn't think they tied them together that well. The strong points for me were the opening dream sequence and the low speed car chase. I thought both of these came off really well. The dream gives us great insight into what goes on in Atticus's head, more or less. And the car chase really gave you a lot of things to think about as you're watching them agonize through it. The line where he talks about stories being like people, loving them doesn't make them perfect, was the thing in the book that kind of hooked me in. And it's where you really see the connection to his experience with everything he encounters and how that's all connected to the family relationships. And you'll see how that all plays out as things go on. I do think the execution came together pretty well. The music, the acting, the little bit of changes they made in the adaptation seem to be still true to the spirit of what I read. And there's really no glaring shortcomings here in the finished product. So I'm going to leave it there. Let me know in the comments what you think. Had you read the book? Do you think they did a good job of adapting it so far? Did you go in blind with no ideas? Were you surprised by the fact that it's not an adaptation of an H.P. Lovecraft story? What are your ideas about where things are headed? What are you hoping to see? I'm definitely going to do recaps for every episode, so definitely subscribe if you're watching along. I may do some extra bonus videos throughout the week. We'll just see how popular it is and and how much interest there is. I thought this was a very good start and I'm excited to see where it goes. I have a feeling that this is gonna turn out to be a really good season of television, so let's watch it together. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, I'll talk to you soon.